Yeah, it's a great pleasure to have Professor Subodh Patil from Institute Lawrence for Theoretical Physics, University of Leiden, uh, Netherlands, in our QSTM forum. This is the 60, uh, 65th uh, QSTM Zumina, actually. And he's going to speak about what's left to learn from primordial observables, effectively speaking. And uh, thank you, Subodh, uh, for agreeing to give this seminar for all of us. And uh, we are uh, happy that you agreed. And we hope that we can able to learn a lot of things from this talk. Now you can start from your end. Yeah. Thank you, Santan. Is, is, is my connection OK on my end? I, there was a little bit of a, a glitch second ago for me. No, it's OK. It's OK. okay. So, so thank you very much. And um, um, uh, thank you kindly for the invitation. Um, and uh, I, I you know, would very much encourage all of the participants to please just unmute and interrupt. Um, if there are any questions, I see there's, there's not so many participants to begin with, so that makes it even better. I actually quite enjoy having more sort of intimate conversations with, with people. And um, so today I'm going to uh, give you what I hope uh, will be perhaps, um, uh, I wouldn't say unusual, but perhaps a, a novel perspective um, compared to some of the speakers you may have to just remind ourselves where we are at this point in time, which is um, we have in life um, two standard models, um, and both of which are extraordinarily the, the sort of the, the main, the head honcho standard model is the standard model of particle physics. And And um, you know, okay, it's sort of fit on the side of a mug that you can buy at the certain gift shop. Um, and with these, there is some debate as to precisely the number of free parameters it has, but let's say about 26 free parameters. You tune them in just about any process um, up to some um, small deviations that we're seeing now, but none of them are particularly statistically significant, I would say. Um, there are no deviations from its predictions to date. Um, so this is at once fantastic, um, physics works. We're evidently very good at it. Um, Hi, Subodh. Can you able to hear me? this model, um, we have, if you like, um, to call it a theory is a stretch. I've heard people call it a theory. I, I think that that is uh, wrong. It is not a theory, it is a parameterization of the data, okay? Uh, of which there are six numbers. Um, and of course, there are many more you could add, but these six numbers um, are also similarly phenomenological. And they also explain all, um, or excuse me, all known observations, all observations we have up to date are consistent with these six numbers being the way they are. So this also begs the question, where do these six numbers come from? And um, there are no statistically significant deviations yet, although the Hubble tension is starting to get very interesting, I would say. Um, but as of, let's say two or three years ago, you would have said that there's um, no significant. Um, and this also begs the question, is there a deeper theory that accounts for even a subset of these parameters? 
So it's often heard, uh, you may hear something that something to the effect that inflation predicts, um, you know, some of these numbers, that's actually in a um, operational sense incorrect. Uh, you, you fit a posteriori parameters, such as the amplitude of the scale, the, the spectral index, um, and it's tilt is something that, you know, the simplest models suggest could be read, but other models could give you just about any number you like. So, so Subodh, I yeah. have a few questions here. Absolutely. First of all, yeah, first of all, like, uh, till now we know that Planck didn't detected gravitational waves, primordial one. Yes. So, if Planck will detect in near few Planck or some, some other probes, will yes, yes. the tensor to scalar ratio. Yes. Then, what would be the changes here? What think you will see? Okay, so in so far as explaining um, um, the, the the large scale structure observations that we're using to confirm these six numbers, I would say not very much. Um, it's not going to help us tune this cosmological standard model. But if, as you say, Planck detects gravitational waves, and moreover, we see that it satisfies its, the single field tensor to scalar consistency ratio, I would then start to, you know, as, as an inflation skeptic, I would then start to say, well, this is really incredible. This is actually very strong evidence that maybe it really was inflation. But insofar as explaining uh, cosmic structure at the level we see, the presence of gravitational waves at the level at which uh, a CMB experiment could detect uh, has very little effects on the structure, the large scale structure of the universe. Yeah. Does that, does that make it clear? Yeah. Next question is like, yeah. if uh, primordial gravitational will be detected, then is it possible to distinguish between the primordial models of the universe, like inflation, bouncing models, other models, and scenarios? Well, yeah, well, okay. So um, uh, let me, let me uh, say that uh, in general, the more information we have, the more that possibility to distinguish becomes possible. Um, obviously, having gravitational waves is, a, is, a, is, a, is more information so that could only help. Now, whether it proves inflation, um, I think, uh, or versus something else, uh, I would argue the following way. If somebody is giving you a model that says, I can predict this number being anywhere from zero to one, or well, not really one, that's getting to this strong coupling, but zero to say 0.1, and that's a flexibility I have in my model, and then you find it to be some number, does that confirm that model? And I would argue, no, it doesn't. And so this actually is something that uh, um, I thought was quite uh, uh, puzzling, actually, about the community's reaction when they thought BICEP2 was giving you gravitational waves, is that it, it just, you know, it would have, had it seen it, it would have said there are some gravitational waves present. Does that prove inflation? The answer is no, it doesn't. But it certainly... Uh, adds, if you like, confidence to your prior that maybe it wasn't something else, because if you like the only other competitor theory that people accept, um, and this is, again, is a sociological statement, not a scientific statement, predicted no gravitational wave. But again, it's also uh, a sociological statement because some models, uh, some models do. Now, if you really wanted to distinguish between bounces and, and inflation, I would argue that the most interesting uh, observable to look at is non gaussian uh, for the following reason. Um, again, uh, this is also uh, really, you know, fleshing out the point that I was headed towards with this talk, which is that in cosmology, we are never measuring anything, okay? Unlike in particle physics. In particle physics, we can repeat the experiment again and again and again and again and again. So we have the benefit of doing frequentist statistics. Whereas in cosmology, we are stuck with doing Bayesian uh, for the simple reason that we only want this experiment once. And so we have a realization of some stochastic process, one single realization of some stochastic process in the sky, which we, we then sort of, you know, uh, uh, so if we were somehow gods and could, you know, repeat this universe many, 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 many times and take an ensemble average, then we could get to the same level of confidence as particle physicists do. Because we don't have that luxury, we have to, you know, make priors. And um, these, these numbers can only be determined, as I will, I, I hope, explicitly show you, uh, uh, in, in a few slides on, uh, with enough assumptions, with enough priors. So um, one of the things that you that is that you can, if you allow me the assumption that the universe is adiabatic, meaning that there is only a single clock at work, 
if you assume that, then there's something really amazing that you can do to distinguish between bounces and um, uh, inflation, which is that um, it's actually impossible uh, for any other background other than close to Dissiter um, or close to Minkowski, by the way. So you can actually have an emergent universe doing the same thing. Um, to, it, these are the only two backgrounds for which you can generate scale invariant perturbations. If you can generate scale invariant perturbations, these are the only two backgrounds that keeps the non-gauss entities under control for an arbitrarily large number of scales. So one would be able to distinguish between bounces and, um, and something like an emergent universe or inflation because both have close to vanishing order parameters, epsilon if you like, um, but we don't have nearly enough statistics on this um, in, a, in a way that I hope to make very, very clear and explicit over the next slides. So yes, um, we can uh, in principle distinguish with enough, with enough information um, whether it's just tensors that give us that information, um, I'm skeptical, but tensors plus many other things will certainly help us understand this question a lot better to a higher degree of confidence. Um, certainty, to the level of certainty, on the other hand, um, it, would, it would really take a lot in my view. Thank you for the clarification. And my last thing is, like, I know that to fit a cosmological model or whatever, we need this at least six uh, quantities, physical quantities, which is very important. Like now the question is like my students and other may ask you that why particularly this uh, six numbers? What, what are the, why they can able to fit all the models and all? What's there actually? What's the sp specialty on this six parameters? So, sorry, Sainton. Can you? Yeah, you, I, I, you, you I, I, no? you're, are you cut out quite a lot? But let me let me uh, state what I think your question was, and then you tell me if I got it if I misheard. I think your question was why these six numbers. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, I would say we don't know. We have no idea. Okay. okay. So if we just stare at these six numbers. Um, Imagine um, what these, what these, what, let, let's, let's go through each one of these six numbers. One by one. Now this one um, is actually uh, a statement about, um, you know, the post thermal history, uh, the thermal history of the universe post recombination. And what reionization is, is the statement that uh, when the first stars started to form, they were basically, the radiation was so powerful that the neutral hydrogen in the universe was basically reionized. And once you have, you know, electrons, free electrons floating around the universe, they can rescatter off of CMB photons. And so in some sense, it's a miracle, by the way, that we're seeing the anisotropies in the cosmic microwave background that we're doing, because if that optical depth was, um, if you like, um, um, you know, if, if the universe is any more opaque, that information would have been erased. So that's somehow a sort of a derived quantity. Uh, but things like the the the, uh, the dark energy density, the dark matter density, do you have a theory that predicts the, these numbers to have these precise values? And I would argue that maybe that's asking too much of any theory. Maybe, in fact, simply uh, like to show how to understand dynamics. It's not about explaining initial conditions up to some you know some reasonableness as to whether they're naturally realizable. Um, and so why these six numbers, I would say we have very little clue. Uh, some people will say inflation predicts two of them. I will say they're taking you for a ride. Uh, inflation doesn't predict e any of them. It just, it, you post fit one of them, which is the amplitude, it's completely tuned. And the other one, you sort of wave your hands and say, well, if there's a field rolling down a potential, maybe it's red. Um, but these are the same characters or same sort of view that if you showed them anything else, they will fit any number you want. And I hope to show you in a couple of slides an exercise where I could sort of tell you that, you know, that number is only that number if you make enough assumptions. In fact, um, the actual underlying physics could be and might be and perhaps even is a lot more richer than being parameterized by a tilt and an amplitude. Thank you. Does, Thank does you. that, does that uh, get anywhere yes. close to your question, Sainton, or, yes. or is it unsatisfying? No, 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 I'm not unsatisfied. It's, it's okay because like as uh, the slides go on, go, people can able to understand that why these six numbers more and more. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I hope, I hope, uh, so I, I did actually plan on uh, taking a guided tour of actually how all these numbers connect to something uh, yeah, that's okay. close to my heart and, you know, yeah. a lot of people. No, I know that, I know that, how we actually connect I know that answer, but like, I asked for the other people, those who are not cosmologists. Absolutely, I understand. Yeah. 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 And I, and I do encourage everybody else to please just, you know, yeah. turn on the microphone. And chat. I'd okay. much rather have a conversation that, that, you know, where we all learn something than finish my talk. So, yeah. Um, sure, sure. Sure. Okay. So, this, this is really just uh, meant to, just to set up the, uh, um, the sort of the, the general sort of uh, background for um, why someone like myself and many other people think about the things that they do. And so if your question, if your goal is to sort of understand what the physics is behind these numbers, um, you know, you, you kind of want to take stock of what is available to you and how you can even know these things. So if I were to make, a, I think the most obvious one is the cause of microwave background. Um, and We've already spoken of quite a bit about its anisotropies, but there's one dimension that has gotten very little attention uh, to date, and this will actually be part two of my talk if I if I get there, which is to discuss uh, the information in this is called the microwave background spectrum uh, in spectral distortions. That's something that we've 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 um, we've basically left uh, untapped as at this point, other than to constrain it to be consistent with the black body to some very uh, large degree. There's also um, the same initial condition uh, fast forwarded um, through cosmic time and, and imprinted on large scale structures. So you can also see initial conditions. You're just looking at the same initial conditions of all forward in time. And of course, uh, you know, they're going to leave, they have to leave some imprint on large scale structure. Um, and so large scale structure surveys, both photometric and spectroscopic. So either looking at intensity or, or spectra so to see with you know, redshift. Um, will give us some information. Um, so, Scott, yeah. uh, my question here is the initial condition means you are uh, saying some primordial perturbations? I'm sorry, Sarantan, you, I, I, uh, I, I didn't hear your question. Can you? I said that initial condition means the primordial fluctuations you are talking about. I mean these six numbers. Oh, okay, okay. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, yeah. So, so, so the primordial fluctuation set up, if you like. Uh, There's many, many things I could add, but so far we, they have not been uh, necessitated. Um, there's um, um, another way in which we could probe this physics, um, which is, is just now starting to be uh, understood. Uh, uh, the problem is there's a lot of foreground modeling we need to understand before we can do any cosmology with it. And this is um, so-called 21 centimeter tomography. And so the idea is that the universe is mostly hybrid. Um, and in fact, uh, the universe was mostly hydrogen before stars started to form as well. So when we look out into the night sky, um, we see things that shine at us. So galaxies, you know, the cosmic web. And at the very, very edge, if you can see my cursor, at the very, very edge of the visible universe, we have the less scanning surface due to the cosmic microwave background. But um, there's this entire sort of shell in between uh, that we don't actually see much of. So we're seeing, so if you like this, this sort of wedge was, it's very outdated, but it's what the uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey um, has, has seen. Of course, this, this slice here is, is basically our, uh, you know, not being able to see our galaxy. And so there's all of these, all of this sort of volume, if you like, our, our, of our Hubble volume, that we don't really have um, many ways, many things shining back at us in order to see what's going on there. But because the universe is mostly hydrogen, and because hydrogen in its ground state actually has a, has a, has a transition from uh, the ground state being uh, aligned or energy line with the spin of the nucleus, uh, the proton, um, this, this transition in the rest frame of the hydrogen atom emits a signal 
at, uh, I believe, 1.4 gigahertz, and that's uh, 21 centimeters um, um, wavelength. And so by looking at this, uh, looking at this, this background, if you like, this background evidence, which is backlit by the cosmic microwave background, and looking at how this background evolves over time, we're learning about structures in the dark ages before things started to form. And so this is very important um, for a reason that I'll get into in a little bit, which is that it's giving us volume information about structure that up till now, we only have the very slightest slices with large scale structure and a two dimensional projection in the CMB. So um, something that's, that's even more exciting, um, which we're gonna get around to space-based interferometers is the potential signals we'll get from gravitational waves at frequencies that are telling us something that are much more cosmological versus let's say astrophysical uh, in nature. Um, so these are all the, the, the things, um, the menu of, of options ahead of you as to how you could um, you know, be probing the physics that you're, that you're interested in. Um, and so let's, let's go through these um, and I will make a connection to particle physics very, very rapidly. Um, um, but let's, let's just sort of focus first on the cleanest probe we have today. Uh, cleanest in the sense that you know, um, the scales that we're looking at are still uh, linear uh, as far as structure formation is concerned. Um, and foregrounds are relatively uh, straightforward enough, uh, although it's still a big headache uh, to clean. Um, but nevertheless, our cleanest probe of the early universe has been the cause of microwave background. And what we're seeing is uh, a black body spectrum uh, of about 2.7 Kelvin with something like one part in 100,000 fluctuations. Okay, so this is really basically a perfect, uh, perfectly isotropic sphere of radiation about 2.7. Kelvin. Uh, one part in a hundred thousandths, to put it into context, if the earth was smooth to one part in a hundred thousandths, there would be no feature bigger than a 30 meter hills. Okay, so this is a really, really smooth distribution with the tiniest of fluctuations. Um, and it's these fluctuations that we're, we're observing now to larger and larger accuracy and learning about, um, you know, the, we're basically getting a snapshot of the, of the um, gravitational potential at the time of last scattering. Um, and so if you were to just sort of take an information theoretic viewpoint and ask, well, what is the information content of the CMB? So if you have a radiation field coming at you in every direction, what's the obvious thing to do? Well, you can look at its intensity and you can put a polarizing filter and just, you know, you know, get it, get, get, get some information about its, uh, its, um, you know, its, its spectrum. So that, that, that's really all that you can do. There's nothing more there, right? It's just a radiation field. So if you assume that the spectrum is thermal, right? Then there's only one number that parameterizes it, that's a temperature. So uh, because the predictions of the Big Bang is that it's thermal radiation, then you're almost done. You just pin the temperature of the thing and that's it. So what's left? It's just the temperature and the polarization in every direction. Um, of course, if there are any deviations from black body, then that's a whole other dimension of information that could tell us something, which I will get to later. But so far, let's assume uh, that it's a black body. And if you were to look at these uh, anisotropies and do uh, decomposition in terms of spherical harmonics, you end up with what Planck has seen over here. And so this, this plot needs a bit of uh, interpretation uh, in the sense that um, there are all of these big error bars here, why? Uh, and these seem very, very compact, also why? So I should stress that these are binned data sets. So there are bins in L space where things are collected and if they hadn't been binned over here, you'd actually see much more scatter also persisting up here. Um, and the reason there is this scatter is statistical. It's, 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 it's very clear. This is cosmic variance, which is saying that we have, a, um, we have a Gaussian random field fluctuating in the sky, but we only have one realization of it. And so because you only have one realization of it, not everything is gonna be exactly according to the, exactly sitting on the peak of the Gaussian, there's gonna be little fluctuations off the side. And at larger and larger scales, we have fewer and fewer trials. So when you, when, you, when you average over the sky and you go from a, you know, an angular distribution to, uh, to, the, to its, if you like, its, uh, its Fourier transform, its uh, spherical harmonic, you're going to get some random scatter. And um, um, the so information what, content of the cosmic, yes? Uh, yeah. Is there I, a question? I, in the previous, uh, this uh, angular distribution plot, my question was like, uh, 
I know that for low L there is a it's like the error bars are very high, but is there is any intake from plan they are planning to do to reduce this kind of error bar soon or something like that? It's not a it's not an error bar. It's cosmic variance. Yeah. Right. And so there's no observation that's going to do better than that. Okay. Unfortunately. Um, yeah. In the sense that it's it's sort of like uh, it's sort of like low. It's like low end statistics, right? So so you know imagine um, you know it's like it's like somebody giving you a coin, but they're not telling you whether it's a fair coin or not. They put you into a room and you see the results of two gamblers, but they only had three goes. Right, or three or four trials, right? Because that's that's the number of trials you have at, at for for quadrupole, for instance. There's four. There's only four moments, and so can you deduce what the true moment whether the coin is fair or not for four? The answer is no. You will have an estimate with large error bars, and that's what we're doing. That's the same mathematics that's happening here. So unfortunately, at the larger scales, um, um, we we don't uh, we don't uh, you know we don't have much of a shot now. Um, I think, you know, if our civilization uh, can survive millions of years into the future, what's really cool, what I think is really interesting, maybe, maybe even billions, is, I mean, it's not going to happen, but, you know, whatever we evolve into, if we can have this information over billions of billions of years, what's happening is that the last scattering surface actually starts to trace out a different uh, volume in the universe. So a patient enough observer could get better statistics on this. Um, but us here in our human lifetime, we're not going to Okay, thank you. Yeah. So, um, so the information content of the CMB is 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 limited um, because what happens actually is that at smaller and smaller angular resolutions, the CMB starts to crap out, um, and for temperature fluctuations. What you have is that you have radio sources and uh, I mean, essentially uh, Sunev Zeldovich clusters starting to dominate at about 1, 2,500 uh, of the sky. So, a Sunev, okay, so the Sunev Zeldovich effect is um, clusters are full of hot gas. Um, and this gas can basically scatter off of a CMB photon, right? And then, you know, start to affect it and scatter it. And so, you have another scattering surface to deal with, right? It's no longer just, it's not longer just free streaming from vast scattering, it's being affected. So what, so at, at, at angles below, you know, L of 2500, you start to see SZ clusters. And so the information content of the CMB starts to become subdominant to actual astrophysical foregrounds. Um, for E mode polarization, this actually doesn't happen until about L of 5000. Um, so, a, um, um, the, 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 there's, 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 there's two things that are at play here. So, so why is this happening? One of them is that indeed foregrounds are starting to come brighter and brighter, but it's also because uh, the CMB itself is starting to get uh, dissipated because of the free streaming, um, uh, free streaming and, and, and scattering uh, effects. So here's a, a plot that actually shows this effect quite beautifully, and it's a quite outdated plot. It's actually from uh, 1996, and so um, if you like the, the the predicted the forecast acoustic peaks are very different from the ones we saw because they didn't think that we'd ever find dark energy. But that's actually quite an amazing uh, thing to note. But the idea is that um, there is this phenomenon called silk damping that's basically erasing small scale anisotropy. So if you can see my cursor, right? So this is typically this is something uh, you know uh, corresponding to what we would see in the in, in, in the CMB. And this is what would have what we would have seen if the last scattering surface was an instant flash. Okay, the the reason the the, the, the fact that it's not an instant flash, meaning that you know as soon as hydrogen started, uh, you know as soon as hydrogen started forming, as soon as free electrons found protons form bound states, um, if that moment happened in a flash, everywhere you look, there would have the, the the photons would have last scattered at the same time, and you just get the information. But because this process takes some amount of time, it takes about 50, Z goes from, you know, the window in Z is about 50, the photons undergo a small random walk and then they come to you. And that small random walk erases the small scale structure and I sort of you to see. And so that's the difference between um, this curve here, which is what you would have seen if the last scattering surface was an instant in time versus not. And this physics is known as silk damping. It's an exponential cutoff. And this scattering effect, so I just talked about free streaming effects, there's, 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 I mean, okay, it's a combination of free streaming and scattering. But nevertheless, 
the primordial signal starts to go down and the astrophysical signal starts to come up and you eventually run out of sleep. So um, what that's telling you is that you have a finite number of pixels to extract the information that you like. And the damping tail, if you like, the, the, very, uh, the high L tail is going to be measured so precisely by you know, the upcoming small scale ground-based CMB experiments, which can basically integrate over time so their signal to noise ratio becomes very, very high. Um, um, they're going to be so accurate that they're going, to measure, they're going to be measuring the damping tail so accurately that now um, the what you see is going to be sensitive to the sum of the neutrino masses. Um, and there are forecast sensitivities for, for ground-based CMB experiments to be sensitive to the sum of neutrino masses to the order of 10 to the minus two electron volts. Meaning that the damping tail would look different if the neutrinos really were massless versus if they had a small mass. Okay. Um, it causes it causes the damping tail to, to go down a little bit. And so if CMB experiments, you know, confirm that there's a lower bound on the sum of the masses of the neutrinos, that would be spectacular. That would be a cosmological measurement of a BSM parameter. So um, and by that I mean, you know, if you imagine you know, the neutrinos getting a mass by the Weinberg operator. So there's this dimension five operator where you, you know, where you basically, you know, Higgs, um, you know, um, you know, this, this operator here, the, the neutrino anti-neutrino operator, and you have to divide by a mass scale. And that mass scale, uh, if you put in what this, if you put in this quantity here has to correspond to mass scale of point of electron volts, it sets this cutoff, or if you like this, the scale of new physics as it were to be 10 to 16 GeV. So there is possibility of doing some real beyond the standard model physics um, using cosmology. And I think that's really neat. Um, but we're not there yet. Um, 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 and moreover, something that um, I would like to, and this is really getting to the, if you like, the, the beginning of the talk where we're sort of going to step back a bit and be a little bit more epistemologically aware, self-aware of what, what we're really concluding from what we're seeing. Um, we have to realize that this information is highly compressed, okay? Um, we have 2,500 pixels in the sky for T for temperature anisotropies and about 5,000 squared for E, uh, E polarization anisotropies. And that's down from a volume uh, by a factor of, you know, 10 to the three. So that's a 10 to the three compression, okay? A thousand factor, a thousand compression of the data, um, which is a lot, okay? So I don't know, um, um, I don't know if anybody here has sort of, um, you know, dealt with signal processing or or anything or, or anything like this. But you know, if if I took a signal, if I took a if I took a longitudinal signal, let's say sound waves, and I compressed the information by a factor of a thousand, um, you lose a lot of information potentially. Um, and you know, I'm imagining taking something like you know an audio signal and imposing some random compression by a factor of a thousand. I mean, I lose all information other than whether there's a sound on or off. I can't tell if the person speaking Russian or German or anything like this. I just know that it's okay. Now someone's speaking. Now someone's not speaking. And that's it, right? Um, so this potentially is a is a huge compression, and this is kind of getting to what I wanted to to emphasize here is that maybe something interesting is going on, other than you know just you know if you like uh, vanilla initial conditions. It doesn't have to be, uh, but um, well, I'll get to it in a second. And of course. Um, Perhaps if I get if I have time to get the part two of the talk, there is a whole dimension of information that we're not even discussing yet, which is the spectrum. Is it really a black body, and does it deviate from a black body? If so, by how much, and what does it tell us? And I argue that it is another portal into particle physics in regimes that only, that phenomenologists can only dream of. Okay, so um, I mean, I'm talking about you know constraining warp extra dimensions above 100 GeV, things like this, the things that particle physicists have absolutely no shot of doing. Um, but of course, the difference again is that we only have one trial. So cosmologists are stuck doing Bayesian inference where particle physicists get to do superficial statistics. So it's really the, the ontology of how we know what we know in cosmology is very different from particle physics. Nevertheless, with enough courage, you can proceed and try to figure this out. So how does this work? How do we actually relate all of these things that I'm talking about, these really you know, um, abstract concepts, you know, well, not abstract, but these, these sort of, you know, very, you know, late time things that happen in our universe to things that I imagine most people in this, in this audience are more comfortable with. 
which is Lagrangians and models and you know theories of gravity. So, so this is the tree, right? Is that you have some underlying uh, fundamental description. Let's say it's something beyond the standard model. I just picked this Lagrangian for the sake of having something to show on this slide. And you go from this to what we call the curvature perturbations, which then um, you know, imprint on the temperature perturbations, which then imprint on the density perturbations that end up feeding large scale structure. And so what we're going to do in the next, I'd say 10, 15 minutes is unpack this process and hopefully see how this sausage is made and understand for yourself that one can only make statements such as we are constraining the spectral index of the cosmic microwave background to the third significant figure with enough assumptions. Okay, it is by no means true that this is an observed quantity. That is not a correct statement. It is physically a wrong statement. What we're saying instead is that the data is consistent up to a certain confidence interval with this parameterization of the data. That is a very different statement than saying it is observed. And this is something that you should be very mindful of when people tell you these things. And there is actually a bit of a, a reason for, I mean, there's, 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 a, there's a very functional reason for this, right? Which is that our poor colleagues, our, our observational cosmologists, they don't want to be bothered with all of these intricacies and subtleties. They just want a simple parameterization. So they're going to leap on the simplest parameterization of the data. But you had better make sure that that parameterization captures somehow some notions that you think are useful for parameterizing physics, the physics that you don't know. And so, so you know, one of the messages that I want to get across in this talk is that only by having a firm standing of where we stand as theorists, as particle theorists, as people who do string theory beyond the standard model cosmology, our observational priors must be informed by our theoretical priors. Otherwise we could be missing things completely. And I will show you a very, very um, interesting demonstration of this shortly, but let me just first flesh out this, this process. Um, and I think, um, um, I think um, you know, if, you, if you're sort of a particle physics gravity oriented person, um, this is hopefully where all of this becomes a little bit clear, right? So, we begin with just Lagrangians, right? We have some theory of gravity and I, it doesn't have to be Einstein-Hilbert, it could be Einstein-Hilbert plus whatever, anything I would add so, all the higher dimensional of it. Yeah. So I have one question uh, in your previous yeah. slide. Yeah. Yeah, so you have mentioned about the beyond the standard model particle physics. So mm -hmm. uh, the, like any signatures of like supersymmetry or such kind of thing can be confirmed through these fluctuations or possibly, right? But, but so possibly, but we don't have any evidence. So let me cut to the final chase. We don't have any evidence for it yet, but um, we don't have any evidence of it from having parameterized our data in a very particular way, okay? So, um, I don't, I'm not so sure about supersymmetry because it's not something I think about very much, but um, uh, um, you know, let's say, I mean, this is precisely the point of the next, if you like 10 minutes, what if there was some new physics, how could we tell? Okay, that's, that's exactly where this is going. Um, any symmetries you have, symmetries are different, right? So symmetries are actually better um, because symmetries are very constraining for what your observables are. And so in fact, it's probably easier to detect if there was some symmetry at play in your universe than if it wasn't, than if there wasn't. So something like supersymmetry, I'd imagine would be a bit more straightforward to detect than let's say there was another field floating around that was doing something else. That would be harder to detect. Um, and as it is, in fact, the very fact uh, that I'm, I'm actually, this is actually really the under the foundation of a lot of what I'm about to say next. The very fact that there's an effective shift symmetry in the early universe is the only reason we can see, we can even see what we're seeing. Um, um, if that wasn't true, we'd have all primordial information completely destroyed uh, in a way that I hope to make clear. I mean, you're asking me something that I'm about to explain out, so. Um, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, but I, I wanted, but you, made, you raised an important point, right? Which is that there's a distinction to be made between symmetries as you know, are there new symmetries in, in your in your physics versus is there new is there something else? Is there another particle? Is there an extra dimension? Those are harder to constrain. Symmetries are, are beautiful, right? Because symmetries are constraining. They, they, why, they have, relation. why have particularly asked this question? Because you've mentioned about the shift symmetry 
like yeah. particularly super gravity have this kind of properties like shift symmetry and all so yeah i did some kind of model building from longer time from super gravities and all which have shift symmetries and all but yeah like i since you hard mostly deal with data and you know better than me that how that can be handled yeah well i No, no, but, but let me put it like this. So, so indeed, supergravity has shift symmetry, but has, I would say it has many more symmetries, right? And, and shift symmetries are actually uh, the province of, of effective field. I mean, I, I mean they're, they're ubiquitous, right? And I would say, um, um, well, well, let me let me continue. So, so, uh, so, but, but I would say that um, um, you know the, the existence of shift symmetries in, in, in effective field theory are you know. Supersymmetry, the very detailed story of time dependence. I'd be very surprised if there was any type of supersymmetry in, a, in the early years. Um, but that's me, that's my personal bias, but you're, you're, you're welcome to go. But I don't want to get bogged down in specifics. That's not the point of this, this, this talk. It's the point of this talk is operationally sort of, or, or this part of the talk, it's operationally setting aside how we know what we know and the qualitative distinction between um, symmetries and new physical scales. That's it, that's all we can tell. Um, and you will never be able to go and say, it is this. That's just, we just don't have that information yet. Um, um, again, this is something that I hope will become very, very apparent, right? Um, um, you know, you, your questions, I think, would have been anticipated, I hope, by, you know, the next several slides, um, is, is that, is that it's, it's very, it's, it's, there's, a, there's a huge amount of degeneracy. And the only thing we can do, the, if you like, the operation, the most consistent and, and the cleanest thing we can do is to act like effective field theory, right? And so an effective field theory doesn't give a damn what your fundamental theory is, as long as it looks a particular way at the scale that you're looking at. And that's where this is, this is going, because that's really all we know. And the only things that are manifest at the level of your correlation functions are the symmetries that this effective field theory is respecting, or is an expression of that, is the better way to put it. Okay, so... Um, yeah. Fine. Yeah. So, so, so let's just see how this works. So, so, so again, so I, 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 uh, I advertise, write down any Lagrangian you want with the proviso. And this is an important proviso. And it's a very restricting proviso, but I'm gonna make it nevertheless. That there's, it corresponds to only one propagating degree of freedom. So it's single clock, okay? We can, we can change this if you like later, but I just want to show you the amount of information content you gain just from that single assumption. Okay, so if if there is only one degree of freedom in the universe, and you write down, um, uh, excuse me, low energy propagating degree of freedom, right? So you can have all sorts of you know massive growth. What you can have massive, you can have you know in effective theory, you also start to see states propagate at some high mass scale. I'm not interested in those. There's only one propagating low energy degree of freedom. I write down the most general Lagrangian. I, I could have higher dimensional gravity operators, like uh, anything else. And moreover, if um, if, uh, um, well, let, let, let's proceed. And so in this theory, I have some background being sourced by the dynamics of some background theory. Okay, so the, 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 the universe evolves, the field does what it does, and there's fluctuations. Now, general relativity is a theory um, with a lot of redundancy. So let's exploit this redundancy and make a coordinate transformation. I can refoliate spacetime. I can make a local time reparameterization um, where this pi is now space-time dependent, and I, I can tune it in such a way that I can refoliate my space-time such that on this new surface, I have absorbed all the fluctuations in this field phi. So therefore, this field is itself the clock. It is the time coordinate. Um, and this begs the question, where did that scalar perturbation go? Right? You had a scalar field coupled to gravity, and it was fluctuating. And now I just refoliate space time and that fluctuation is gone. So where did it go? Um, it got, uh, in a very real sense of the word, it got eaten by the metric. So now the three metric, um, which in the ADM decomposition you use to uh, parameter, you know, to- so yeah. Bob, Can I call this thing kind of gravitational generalization of the Higgs mechanism? Yes, you can. And this is my next slide, so. Yeah, it's it's a bit tricky, but it's it's not it's not quite that. But yeah, 
No? It, it's, it's, it's a bit tricky, but uh, morally, again, I was going to spare my next slide that this is the gold stone of, of non-linearly realizing, realizing time transition effects. Um, so, yeah. uh, is this sort of like a gauge transformation? Because this is, this is exactly a gauge transformation, yes. Okay. This, this, okay. Yeah. Okay. this is a so gauge transformation. So the phase actually gets absorbed into the field as well? This is a this is a real scale lift field. There's no phase here. Okay, 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 okay. Got it. Yeah, yeah. But but no, but morally, okay. So 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 yeah, there's some very clever people asking very clever questions. So so morally, what you're doing there is you're you're asking for something that um yeah, you're you're basically completely absorbing this field. Um and uh, the language really is isomorphic, and I think the questions you're anticipating um are definitely anticipating that. And um um, and if you like, even the gauge choice that we use is called a unitary gauge, uh, even though okay. it really is called co-moving gauge. Um, okay. But but you know, we'll, we'll, really what we're doing, so this is a real scalar field. And again, I stress that this, this really works only for a single fluctuating degree of freedom. By the way, we only have evidence that in, in our observations, if there was more than one degree of freedom fluctuating, uh, the perturbations become what we call uh, not adiabatic. So, and, um, and so far, we only have evidence for adiabatic perturbation, so that's why we think this is a reasonable assumption. However, if they weren't adiabatic, it's also very hard to tell if the anyway. I don't want to get into too many details. If you just allow me the assumption that there's only one degree of freedom, let me just do this. Okay, and we've, sure. we've exploited the gauge invariance of general relativity. Okay, sure. Yeah, uh, we've exploited the, general, the gauge invariance of general relativity to absorb the scalar metric. Okay, so. Um, there's a theorem actually by, by York, right? Is that um, if you take pure gravity and you, you set up a Cauchy problem, right? And you do an ADM decomposition, you have some Cauchy surface. The, the, the theorem by York is that um, the metric, the initial data for the three metric, which is this HIJ, will give you the same dynamics and evolution as the initial condition for the same three metric, but now conformally locally rescaled. Okay, meaning that the longer the con the conform the longitudinal mode of this HIJ does not propagate in pure gravity, right? But now we have pure gravity plus a scalar field, and so it does start to propagate. And this is nothing other than the scalar field itself, just written in a very crafty way. Um, and the reason we do this is because it idiot proves the computation, uh, because it turns out that this curly R is a goldstone. Right, and so this is really, you know, the, all the people that are like really trying to, you know, understand is this the gravitational equivalent behavior. It's a bit complicated, right? Because, uh, you know, so there's, 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 so these are these are nonlinearly realizing space-time symmetries, and so um, th there's qualitative differences between the language of symmetry breaking of internal symmetries versus symmetry breaking of space-time symmetries. And the first one, the, the 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 immediate qualitative difference is how Goldstone's theorem works, in fact. So in gauge theory, um, every broken generator, so every unbroken generator corresponds to a, a, you know, a Goldstone mode. Um, um, that counting works a little different uh, for space-time symmetry. So when you've gone from a maximally symmetric space-time with maximally symmetric space-time with 10 killing vectors down to a cosmological space-time where the background is now FRW, so that's six killing vectors, you've lost four killing vectors. So you know, you've broken four. Uh, symmetries. Nevertheless, there's only one. Um, there's only one goldstone, and the reason for this is that it's a bit more complicated. There's this phenomenon called the inverse Higgs mechanism, et cetera, et cetera, and this is worked out by a bunch of Russians in the 70s. And I can give you the reference if you're interested. It's a fascinating subject. Um, but for the purposes of this discussion, this is what we need: is that this curly R is a goldstone, and this has a remarkable, remarkable consequence, which is that for large enough wavelengths, right? Um, the, because there are only derivative interactions, by the way, for Goldstone, there are, there, there's, there, there's only derivative interactions, right? So at large enough wavelengths, you cannot, at any order in perturbation theory, to any order in loops, you cannot get a term in the equation of motion that corresponds to a mass term or anything that's linear. So what does that tell you? That tells you that curvature perturbation equals constant will always be a solution. And that is amazing because that what that's telling you is no matter what happens in the universe between last gathering and today, 
you will always see this constant mode. You'll always see this constant mode. And that is the thing that we're seeing imprinted in the cosmic microwave background. That sources the temperature fluctuations. And if it wasn't for this fact, we wouldn't see this. So, so really the physics of symmetry breaking is really responsible for us being able to look back as close to the Big Bang as possible. And I think that's just fantastic. That's really incredible. You know, thank you universe for this fact. Um, and yeah. Can I interrupt you for a minute? Yes, absolutely. Um, sir, so uh, what do you mean by a Goldstone mode is the same as what do you mean in internal symmetry, right? It is just a massless mode. Uh, no, and again, I, I would really, really emphasize that that we're using the same terminology, but the physics is very subtly different. So in this case, I would say it's something that for which there is a, a shift. Oh, I see. So uh, yeah, it's nonlinearly realized. The only uh, like the doubt I had was that uh, Hij becomes a squared t uh, times uh, an exponential of uh, 2r, but it still has the delta Ij yeah. uh, factor in it. So that still maintains the isotropy of the uh, metric, right? Yeah, I mean, th there's a part here that I suppressed, which is the, gravit the graviton oh, itself, okay. right? I'm just talking about the longitude. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it's it, subtle. So, so, so the language, it, you know, it, it might seem like I'm using the same words, um, and indeed, there's a reason for using the same words, but the physics is subtly different. Um, to the, if you want to just take a one main sort of way in which it's different is the way, you know, that the number of broken generators, two goldstones, the counting works out is very different for space-time symmetries versus internal symmetries. But the key point is that the action is, is just derivatively coupled. Um, there's actually an even better feature, which is that there is an order parameter that emerges now, which is what I, you know, so this is, this is a, a view that I, um, I've been trying to get out into the community quite a lot, is that epsilon, if you like, uh, I'll love to find what that is in a second. And the, the, the thing that parameterizes how you break maximum symmetry um, is an order parameter. And you'll find that the, the action at, at higher and higher orders is continually suppressed by this. It's, it's really, really, you know, it really has all the, you know, all the features of, of what you'd expect. And, and the main point is that there are only derivative directions. And so the constant mode, the, the curvature perturbation is conserved on super random scale. Anything could happen, and you still see the constant mode unmolested from the universe. So um, now in a, in a slide, okay. So, so, so for those of you who kind of followed up to this, this sort of particle physics estimation, um, all of the stuff I spoke about at the beginning will now be tied together with this variable R, okay? So we're now about to do a lightning view of how this connects to cosmology and astrophysics and astronomy, okay? So the, the two point correlation functions of these curly R's, um, in some state, which we take to be the vacuum, the adiabatic vacuum in the case of inflation is the bunch state vacuum. Um, and if I construct this two point function, but I make something dimensionless out of it, and I call the, this dimensionless quantity the, the power spectrum, this power spectrum relates, it ends up interpreting. So if you just work through the, you know, um, the physics of it, you know, the, the going from perturbations, cosmological perturbation theory to, you know, to the, what the temperature fluctuations would be for a photon coming out of a potential generated by this curvature perturbation, which is nothing more than a local three scaling of the, of the three metric. Um, the temperature fluctuations, you can decompose them in terms of spherical harmonics, whose moments, if you assume isotropy, um, 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 if you assume homogeneity and isotropy, um, you know, satisfy uh, this relationship, these C sub L's, Right, which basically sets what these temperature fluctuations are, relates to this two-point function. Okay, this is there's a lot here. There's a lot on this slide, so I'm really throwing a lot at you. But they're convoluted by this thing called a transfer function. Now, this is really important because the transfer function contains two bits. Two bits. One bit is integrating forwards from last scattering uh, through some non, you know, some cosmology. So, so, you know, the thermal history of the universe, realization, all this stuff. Uh, so this factor here is the non-primary cosmology plus a geometric compression factor. This is a spherical vessel function. And what's going on here? We are trying to reconstruct three-dimensional correlation functions, but we only have a two-dimensional hypersurface. Okay. So this is that compression, this factor thousand compression I was talking about. So if you were to look at what this 
what this um, chanter function was and you were to plot it, it looks like this, okay? What we would like, it would, it would be amazing is if it was a delta function, right? Because then that would, that would give you a basically a one-to-one -one dictionary from a cosmological perturbation, something that you see in galaxies or something to something primordial. But instead, all you're doing at best is sampling. And that sampling is an irreducible um, fact, uh, irreducible fact of life, because you are essentially just trying to infer, you're trying to reconstruct the, the three-dimensional correlation function from a two-dimensional projection. And that is going to, you're going to lose some data. But if you assume certain things, such as that, you know, that it's really, you know, that really that those perturbations are just at most, you know, you know, the, the basic scale invariant process is the, the most weakly logarithmically running. This isn't too much of uh, a loss. But my question, my question to myself and you know, to the community and to you is, could there be new physics and new characteristic scales hiding in plain sight? Because maybe there's some little wiggles that we've just lost that, 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 this, that this sampling just sort of misses. Um, and, and this slide I just want to point out is just showing you how, how the sampling can, can sort of sort of you know how the sampling sort of translates uh, from primordial correlation functions to something uh, that you see in the sky. So the CMB transfer functions and the intermeaning thermal expansion history are sampling the underlying two point uh, uh, primordial function. If you like the two point function of the Goldstones, the curvature perturbations, and all we see in the CMB is at this scale. So what we're seeing here, these scales are what are responsible for these wiggles here. So these wiggles here are, are corresponding to um, you know, with scale invariant initial conditions, with thermal history, where there's essentially acoustic oscillations once the mode begins to the horizon, that's what's responsible for this. A little bit further up, so we're seeing scales that are responsible. I, I, I have one question here. Sure. Yeah, I, I just want to ask that, like when you were talking about this transfer function, uh, yeah. the Beagles things I can able to understand because like there is a spherical basal function, but the other part, okay which is like coming from non-primordial cosmology, how you exactly uh, parameterize or uh, how you write down that, I couldn't be able to understand. Yeah, so that, that's, that involves doing a Boltzmann integration of CMB photons. Uh, yeah, so this, this is done by, by, I mean, okay, so for, for large enough angular scales, there are analytic formulae available. Um, but okay, so, 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 so what is that non, so what is this S factor, if you like? What is this non-primordial cosmology? Okay, so, you have a primordial perturbation. It's it's so there's there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a, a valley in the gravitational potential, and your photon is climbing out. But as it climbs out, there's all sorts of other things it has to put up with: reionization, the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect, cosmological expansion, the thermal history of the universe, and that's what this time integral convoluted with this function does. Okay. So this is this is this I could I could I could point you to a textbook where this is where this is done, but. Um, it's very complicated. Yeah, like, like people used to like, or uh, what should I say? Like people used to give some models of that, like probably what is. No, there's no model. This is this is known. I mean, these are these Boltzmann codes, right? Like CAM, CAM or class, or all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's through CAM or uh, like yeah, yeah. Osmium. So, so the point is that the, the non-primordial cosmology is physics we think we understand quite well if we parameterize things in a particular way. So optical depth of reionization, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. But these Boltzmann codes, if you put in certain parameters, which is what these six parameters do, you run the initial conditions through that Boltzmann code, then you get a prediction. And that's what we're comparing. Yes. Okay? Yes. Okay. So, um, um, so with scale invariant perturbations, Right. This is what the CMB would produce, and and there are some. And what I wanted to point out is that the CMB is only sampling things at a particular scale. So this is the horizon scale. That, oh, these axes are not visible. I'm very sorry. Um, if this is the horizon scale, and this is the scale corresponding to about 0.1 inverse uh, megaparsec, which is basically you know where this starts to crap out, large scale structure is sampling a little bit further down. Um, every tracer we have is sampling primordial correlation functions in a slightly different way and at slightly different scales. And um, it surprises people sometimes um, to, 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 to remind them that in fact, at very, very small scales, 
we have no idea what the primordial power spectrum is. It could be much very, very different. It could be huge. Um, but nevertheless, we can still constrain it through other tracers. So for instance, uh, this is where spectral distortions can come in because they're actually sensitive to scales down here, uh, a little bit further up. You have gravitational waves that you would produce um, at second order from very, very enhanced scalar perturbations uh, at second order that would mix and give you gravitational waves. And so we're not completely lost, but we have much less constraints. So, um, so, so cosmology is we're just you know doing like little samples of of primordial information of which the CMB is so far really uh, the cleanest. Um, and so, and so, um, um, just to really end uh, this, not really end, but just to sort of put a put a bookmark on this journey. Let's keep going, right? And say, well, now what about galaxies? So we know eventually that you have these fluctuations from the universe, and then dark matter starts to fall into these into these little per primordial perturbations, and then structure keeps starting to form, and then eventually things start to cluster, and then eventually, you know, you know, you start to form dark matter halos in these clusters, and then you know. The clustering history of the universe begins. And so then by looking at the distribution of matter, we should also be able to infer, we rewind the film backwards, if you like, we read, you know, unintegrate our way through, uh, you know, whatever, uh, you know, code we have to get to the initial conditions. We're also sensitive to, uh, to, to initial conditions through large scale structure, but we're starting to lose a little bit of information because things are becoming more nonlinear. And nonlinearities are very good at erasing information, initial conditions. So it's hard, but let's just see how it works, right? So, so if you have a, a curvature perturbation, if you have a local scaling, rescaling of the three metric, it's Laplacian is by the constraint, Einstein constraint equation, going to give you the matter fluctuation. It has to be sourced by matter fluctuation at that point. So I call that guy delta. The two point correlation function of delta in Fourier space relates to this thing called the matter power spectrum. Okay, now the matter power spectrum is it, 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 you know, so so this this guy relates to so it all relates to this this curly arc that we have to begin, but the relation gets more and more convoluted and complicated. Now, we would like to measure what this matter power spectrum is, but there's a catch: we don't ever see dark matter. Okay, we only see galaxies, and so the relationship between galaxies and the underlying matter structure uh, is related uh, by this quantity called the bias, and that's also very very complicated. But now you see all the different layers, all the different, you know, like knobs and whistles on the on, on the thing. We have we, we can look at stars shining at us. We look at CMBs. We can look at, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm about to get to maybe, you know, other things. All we're trying to do, if you're uh, uh, a um, if you're someone interested in early universe cosmology, is to try and see through all of that and get back at what the initial conditions were, so you could learn something about what happened at the beginning. Um, and so this is this is really the nuts and bolts of how you go from this fundamental physics model and how it imprints on all the things that you could see around us. And here is where we are today. And this is, um, you know, I think there's one way to look at this, which is also that this is actually a really, really beautiful thing, right? But if you're from another perspective, i.e. that of a theorist, you'd be like, this is horrible. I wish we had more information. But the beautiful thing is all cosmological observables are, um, uh, are consistent with adiabatic consistently, right? Not, you know, it's the only possibility that it could be. They're consistent with adiabatic Gaussian and nearly scaling the initial conditions. And this is very, very strong evidence of a particular symmetry breaking pattern in the universe with a very close to vanishing order parameter, which we call epsilon, which is minus h dot over h squared. And this is widely accepted as being a confirmation of the inflationary paradigm. And um, just, just I wanted to just, you know, reward you because you've been so patient and followed through all these details with a pretty animation. And the net effect is if you just took those initial conditions, took those initial seed perturbations, and you just let them evolve um, under their own gravitational potential, and you looked at a, a co-moving box, this is what we end up with. We end up with the cosmic web. So, um, you know, this, this is really the, the, if you like, the, the top to bottom to back to top again view of cosmology and how um, how it relates to particle physics. And, and, and if you like, if those initial conditions were, let's say, somehow different, then we would see a slightly different cosmic web. Um, so by looking at the properties of the cosmic web, by looking at its, at its statistical properties, we are also indirectly inferring information um, about what happened at the beginning. So that's at once very pleasing, 
and nice. Um, but it's also a bit frustrating because, um, you know, as we know from particle physics and condensed matter, um, you know, systems often very, very rarely care about the micro details. They just care about how symmetries are expressed. And this is, again, things in nature. Um, but that doesn't mean that we should stop because some. Sometimes we could still try to understand the micro. Um, there are other uh, sort of question marks of the theoretical viability as of now, um, um, although some would even argue that statement. Um, if the inflection was a real physical degree of freedom, shouldn't there be other scales or correlations hidden in the data? And if so, how do we go looking for them? Okay. And so um, what I'm showing you here is the Planck data, but analyzed in a slightly different so the, the, the red dashed line is, if you like, the scale invariant uh, weekly logarithmically running spectrum that you would say uh, fits the data. So that's the, those are the two numbers of lambda CDM that you've seen the, that, that are responsible for this red line. Now, if you were to then um, stop and say, hang on, um, um, I don't want to make that prior. Maybe there's something going on that's not going to give a power law dependence. Maybe there's some horrible dimensional transmutation and a new degree of freedom opens up at the scale. What would that look like? So if I don't assume that um, the spectrum is, 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 a, is a power law um, and I allow it to be a free function, what do I end up reconstructing? And this is the result of that reconstruction. Okay, as you can see, there is could be a lot going on here. Now, I don't want to um, overemphasize this. I, I'm not advocating what I'm about to do here, but I'm about to run through a theoretical exercise with you to show you um, what what this could mean. So, for instance, um, what I would what I would argue. Oh, and by the way, the reason um, your your you know that, that 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 a direct reconstruction is not going to give you something is is precisely because of this compression, right? So these transfer functions are what's responsible for the fact that there could be wiggles in the underlying spectrum, and we would not know any better. Um, at some scales, they're actually very tightly constrained, much better than at other scales, but the point is that there could be wiggles. In fact, there is a very peculiar anomaly here, which could still be down to cosmic variance, no one really knows, um, but nevertheless, things could be a lot more interesting uh, than we think. And so um, one of the things that I would, would argue, and this, um, this is a perspective that you know, I've been sort of, me and my collaborators have been pushing for more than 10 years now, is that, um, there is a way to do particle spectroscopy, um, you know, by looking for features in the in the in the power spectrum. So, for looking at localized deviations from uh, scalar invariants, um, and what these and what you're doing by looking at this is it's just simply linear response theory. That's it. Is that once you see something moving away and you see some characteristic scales away from it, you can actually infer some new characteristic mass scales um, up to if you like the ontological um, box that you're in, which is that the most you'll ever know is statements within some effective setup. And in effective field theory, many, many, many underlying constructions could map onto the same structures. And so you have to take all this with a pinch of salt. So if you're asking, could this prove supersymmetry? Does prove I don't know. What I do know is that it's telling me that there are, if you like, these Wilson functions that are not that are different from what they were before. How you get those Wilson functions, that's up to you. Um, and notice I said I said these were Wilson function and not Wilson coefficient, because the uh, effective theory of the adiabatic mode. So if I if I had gone and calculated the quadratic action um, for some underlying field theory um, that gave me some model, um, it turns out that I would end up with something that looks like this. After lots of integrations by parts, and I end up with an action that looks like this, where um, there are only three possible functions, any high energy physics model, whatever you have, if it's single clock, it's going to imprint at most in three functions. That's it, nothing more. And these three functions are epsilon, which is essentially the order parameter. This, this epsilon appears at every level in perturbation theory and it's parameterizing how you've broken, um, um, how you've not as time transition invariance or how you've broken time transition invariance. It's up to you how you think about it. Um, and that's one function. And it is sensitive to changes in the zero and two derivative terms in the parent theory. 
Okay, so if you had some theory with a different potential, but a canonical kinetic term, you know, it, the, the difference between two potentials would manifest in epsilon. If you had some theory with some non-canonical kinetic term, but you could still define it away, and you get some power group interactions, so on and so forth, it would manifest in a change in the adiabatic speed of sound. There's another function here, but it's subleading. So for all intents and purposes, um, we don't need to discuss it, but just be aware that it's there. So any, any fundamental physics model you have, I don't care what it is, as long as it's single clock, and that's key, as long as it's single clock. If it's not single clock, there's many more operators that can do. And because this is not Lorentz invariant, the way we're doing effective field theory is we don't have Wilson functions. We don't have Wilson coefficients. We have Wilson functions. And so what could cause- Both this yep. uh, sound speed thing, the M2 basically depends on the model. Yes. And like once you write down the things in the in this language, epsilon CS, or all models you can actually write down in a single language, which is the effective field theory. Thing. That's, that's correct, the, yes. Yeah, that's correct, yeah, yeah. As long as it's single clock, yes? So by that, I mean it's in the perturbations already done. So if that's true, then these, this epsilon speed of sound and this mu are the only ways in which new physics could enter your two-point function, okay? At the level of the three-point function, there's more and more functions that appear and you can count them, but they're still quite restricted. And so how, how would um, you get a, a non-trivial speed of sound? And so this is a, you know, some work that occupied myself and some collaborators that are part of the last decade. And uh, it was quite surprising actually. Uh, and it took us a while to convince ourselves and our colleagues um, of what we found because at the surface it's quite striking. And our claim is that it is possible to have fields hundreds, if not maybe a thousand times heavier than Hubble excited during inflation consistent with decoupling. Um, and it was such a surprise that I actually remember giving this talk at the at the at the TIFR in Mumbai, and uh, I got I got yelled out of the room. I think uh, I won't name who it was, but there was some uh, very curmudgeonly senior professor that was just like, "What are you doing? This is complete garbage." Um, 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 and um, it took us a while to understand what was happening, and we were very very pleased when we did, because we think that we non-trivially corrected people's understanding of effective field theory and when it's valid on a time-dependent background. And why? And it's actually really cool. Um, and the reason is when you have heavy, and it's really just the, basically the physics of bobsled or bobsleighing if you're Canadian or English. And the idea is that if you have time dependence, decoupling is clear, right? Uh, so if you have time independence, decoupling is, is absolutely clear. You know what your heavy degrees of freedom are, you know what your light degrees of freedom are, you can put in a, a little, little line in between and integrate out the things and get effective theory, you're done. But what about when you're in a time dependent context? And so this is this. You don't need to 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 necessarily um, necessarily you know put your hat on this example, but it's a very easy example where you see this happen. So imagine you're a bobsledder and you're going around a curve. Um, one of two things could happen: either you go around the curve so hard that you start oscillating like this as a normal, right? in which case in the in, in simple language we're talking about, you don't have decoupling. You've actually excited the normal mode. Or you're just critically off the potential, and you're always going to be critically off the potential when there's any non geodesic motion in field space. You've excited a heavy direction, still consistent with decoupling. And the physics of it, the mathematics of it, is actually interesting. It's very interesting. Um, and, uh, and the idea is like imagine you have some potential with some curved field space. And uh, in this paper with Cliff Burgess in 2013, we asked a related question which is when can you consistently truncate a field, okay? So imagine you're in particle physics situation, you have some vacuum expectation value, everything is time independent, then it's clear, right? Is there some mass scale? If it's way above any energy scale that you care about, just get rid of it. And the calculations you do with that truncated theory will correspond to calculations that you do the full theory up to corrections in energy squared over that mass scale squared. That's effective field theory. It gets a bit more complicated when you have time dependent. So imagine you have, Precisely the situation where you have a curved field space. So let's be covariant in field space because nothing should care about your, uh, your coordinatization of field space. And you have um, you know, a tangent space, uh, a metric space, uh, you know, a target space with a metric and a potential. 
And you're just imagining some, if you like, some uh, vacuum manifold that you think your field will go down eventually. Now, if you if you decompose the tangent and the normal to the trough of this potential, you would naively say that, okay, and if this mass scale here, if you say that the mass scale orthogonal to your intercept potential, and you say that the, 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 the secondary of the potential in the normal direction is much, much bigger than the secondary of the tangent, you would think naively that this is your heavy direction and this is your light direction, right? I mean, that's, that's a reasonable thing to assume. Um, however, when this valley has a tilt, when it's going down, when you're being forced to move down the potential, when, when the tadpole condition does not allow for a field being sitting exactly where it does, something remarkable happens. Like there's the mass matrix. So if you had truncated this heavy field at this point, you've lost some low energy information because you've basically thrown away some light physics because of this physics. So I invite you to read this paper. It's, 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 it's completely terribly written. It's got poor details, but nevertheless, I think this, 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 this cartoon figure makes it quite clear, I hope, is that it's just it's a misalignment. There is a misalignment that happens in the time-dependent context. And what you thought of as a heavy direction is not really a heavy direction. You have to rotate a bit in field space. So what happens is quote unquote heavy and light in the language of normal and tangent to potential do not correspond to Wilsonian fast and slow. So you better really integrate out your Wilsonian fast guys. And when you do that, um, and you ask the question, when am I allowed to truncate? Previously, it was only the statement that the mass scale is going to infinity. But now, in fact, in this paper, we argue that there's actually two more scales that have to go to infinity. One of them is the curvature of the, of the, uh, of the trough, this, this kappa, which is, the, uh, which is um, encapsulated by this Bernays regulation. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the amount at which the tangent and normal change. And uh, the inverse target space uh, rebound curvature. All of these have to be above uh, the energy scale instrument in order for truncation to be true. If even one of them is not true, um, your Wilsonian fast and slow do not align with your what you thought was your heavy and light by staring at a Lagrangian. It's very subtle. Um, but the net effect, um, and this is, this is by the way, this paper with, with Cliff was just trying to understand work that we had been doing for years before uh, with Ana Achikaro and Gonzalo Palma and Jinuk Gong and, and Stuart Hardman, student who unfortunately um, is no longer with us. Um, um, and what we realized is that precisely when you execute non-geodesic motion in field space, you do get adiabatic reductions in speed of sound. In this particular model, you can get it in many other ways too, um, that correspond to um, this following quantity. You can actually derive it from the underlying effective theory. And the key thing to note is this. This, this is really where, where all the physics comes down to, is that your effective mass gets a centripetal correction. right? And, that, and that's the basic physics of it. Right? Is that if you're going around the bend, the heavy direction gets a little lighter because of the centripetal contribution. And that's all that's happening here is that you can actually, yep, go ahead. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, could yeah, you, no, no, please. This is a, uh, yeah, could you please go yeah. back to two slides before? Yeah, previous one. Yes, that when you are thinking of decomposing the thing in terms of the two fields in the field space, now the mm -hmm. point is like one we actually treat as some entropic mode, another one is a non-entropic mode or some adiabatic mode. So what about the entropic mode? Uh, won't you get so the, that's Okay, so, so you've gone a step ahead, right? So you've gone to the perturbation theory. Yeah. And um, you, you, so this is, this is really at the level of the parent theory, right? So this is, there's no, there's no gravity here, if you like. This is just a scalar field. But let me anticipate your question. And so, so the entropic mode in cosmology that you're talking and the adiabatic mode in cosmology that you're referring to is precisely the tangent in the moment. Okay. Right? Because okay. the adiabatic mode corresponds to reparameterization of the background time, time dependence. So that would shift you along the tangent and the entropy mode shifts you along the normal. Yes. Now what we're saying is that, is that the actual Wilsonian fast and slow misalign very slightly. Yes. Okay. Yes. So you, you have to be mindful of that. Um, and and there's, there's actually a basis which you can go to, which is, you know, partly both. And, and so, but for, for, for gentle enough turns, the, 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 the distinction is, is trivial. Um, but um, I suppose the, 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 you know, modulo that subtlety, right? I mean, incorporating that subtlety, what, we, what, what one can actually show is that you can have 
fields, heavy fields, directions where the mass scale in this or tangent direction, normal direction is hundreds of times greater than Hubble. And you can still just veer off of it ever so slightly without exciting the normal mode. And the effect is a transit reduction in speed of sound. And so this is, this is potentially telling us, and, in, and you know, um, you know and the motivation, um, I, I think uh, I, perhaps Anton could appreciate is actually supergravity for us because one of our uh, co-authors was, you know, Anna Achikar was, is, you know, really, you know, she was a big, uh, she worked on it quite a lot. And, her, and the statement is that, you know, in, in string theory, in supergravity realization of inflation, you know, you basically have a, a, a curved target space for the inflaton where you have one light direction and many heavy directions, but it's curved. And the point is during inflation, you typically have to go many, many cutoffs in field excursion. And if the curvature is close to the cutoff, you're basically going around bends. So what's happening at these bends? And it used to be that people used to truncate. Um, and, um, and, um, and, you know, and I think um, all of this stuff you may have heard about with like cosmological collider physics and, and you know, quasi single field inflation. I understand you've had several talks on this. This is something we saw, in fact. Um, and, we, you know, and, I, and I spoke to uh, the authors, uh, uh, you know, Wang Yi and Xing Chen. I said, look, you know, we, we showed them what we saw, but we weren't interested in exciting fields close to Hubble because that was easy. We were really interested in finding something even more. So we, we sort of kept going and they sort of camped out and worked out this thing and, you know, got a lot of papers out of it. But it's, it's something that, you know, is, is completely, you know, entitled to it. Motivated, but we had a bit more of an explorer bench. And we said we were just really interested in understanding decoupling on curved space because we had seen something really, really puzzling, which is that we would, we would be able to write down, you know, a single field, effectively single field action where you have a field that's being excited it's a thousand times more Hubble. And now I can explain in terms of this language that it's got to do with misalignment. When I presented these results at the Tata Institute, uh, you know, people were very, very upset. They were like, what are you doing? It's completely garbage. It must be wrong. Right? But the point is that it was, it was subtle and it took a while to, to understand. And, uh, and that's really neat. That's really, uh, that's really something that um, you know, we're, we're, we're advocating for is that, is that there are localized transient departures from speed of sound equals unity that are telling you that there are some operators in your parent theory become temp temporarily uh, strongly coupled. And this could be in fact very, very natural. In fact, maybe it's demanded by a realistic embedding of inflation in some high energy theory. And the beautiful thing about this is that this must correlate because of the structure of, uh, of, the, uh, of the action for the adiabatic mode. Uh, this must correlate uh, across higher point correlation functions in a very particular way as well. And so by cross-correlating these statistics, maybe we should be looking for this instead of just parameterizing power laws and things like this. Maybe we're missing some very, very key signatures of high energy physics in our observables because we're not parameterizing it because of our theoretical priors are, are based on a, they're very informed by models. Um, and completely unrelated to what I'm talking about, I want to share with you a very interesting debate that happened in the literature a few years ago. This is, this is really interesting and, and sort of shows you, if you're interested in particle physics, how priors actually inform your, what you're seeing. So do neutrinos have masses? Um, we don't, right? Um, but there was a group, uh, uh, there, was, there, was a, there was a sort of a, a, a debate in the literature where some group put out a claim they were like, yeah, neutrinos, look, there's evidence for neutrino masses. And I, I forget what exactly, but something to do with the CMB cross correlated with something else. And then another group is just like, no, we did the analysis and we're finding that it's not there. You're wrong. And then they went back and forth. And then when you, when you, when you actually dug into it, you realized they were both correct. But what, what was different was one of them was putting a flat prior on the neutrino mass and the other one was putting a log prior. So, the, so you understand. So if you if you just assume that you know if the neutrinos have a mass, then, you know, then maybe um, you know the mass is you know you're, you're sending a prior probability distribution to them, you get different answers. And so how? So we don't have a meta theory of effective field theory. We don't have a theory of Wilson coefficients. We don't know whether you know we say oh they should be of order one unless they're they're protected by technical naturalness and therefore they should be close to zero. And if not, then what is the distribution around those values that we expect? We don't have that meta theory. We need to have that meta theory to be able to do cosmology the way we want to be doing it. We don't have it. So the best we can do is to sort of really sort of be agnostic and step back and sort of separate, you know, sociology. And by sociology, I will be quite adamant about this. There are some people from certain places that are just like, my model is the best, follow me. 
And people are like, well, let's all prioritize our data like this. And it's very frustrating for people that are like, maybe, but there's actually other models too. And it doesn't get looked at. My point is that in cosmology, we need to be very, very honest about what our theoretical priors are. Otherwise, we could be completely missing some real physics here. And this is, um, you know, this is exactly uh, what I would like to what I would like to advocate here, which is that um, in particle physics, um, you know, you know, it's easy, right? It's particle physics is, you know, like let's this is what what I've thrown up here is a dimension six SMEF, standard model effective field theory. There are, you know, so you know, you do enough scattering experiments, you can pick these coefficients, and boom, you're done, right? Um, in cosmology, the functions, and so they can, it, it's, it's just much, much harder to constrain. But nevertheless, we can do it. And what I'm arguing is this process can be done. In fact, that it's been worked out. Um, so, and this is just an exercise, by the way. I want to point out that this is, this is not to be taken as a really, this is pure, pure theoretical overfitting. But I want to point out something. You can do, just, in, 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 in particle physics, we have Wilson coefficients. In the effective theory of, cosmo, uh, of the adiabatic mode, we have Wilson functions. Now, it should be clear that the scale dependence of, cor of, cor of cosmological correlation functions from some underlying theory that just gives you different Wilson functions is the manifestation of the time dependence of these Wilson functions. So the, the fitting that particle physicists do would have to correspond to an inversion for these EFE parameters. So can we exchange the scale dependence of any cosmological correlation functions for the time dependence of the EFP parameters, and therefore then learn something about the characteristic scale? And so what I would like to argue, well, to show you, in fact, I mean, show you this is done, is that you can do this. And in this exercise, what I'm about to do is I'm going to take, imagine I say, whatever this lambda CDM line is, it's just a straight line. It's like, let's just say somebody forces me to fit this wiggly line. This is the real data. I'm not saying it is, but if it were, what theory gives us that? Okay, and and this is a sport that people play. I think a lot of people, you know, Ayuka also plays this game, which is you know trying to sort of you know say there's features and like you know, here's a model that can give it. Here is a concrete dictionary that takes whatever scale dependence you see in your correlation function and gives you a Lagrangian. Okay, and it's and it's it's in this paper, and the idea is, um, you can um, whenever you have a perturbation, it's linear response theory, and then just inverting it to go transforms. Okay, so I don't need to, I don't, I don't want to bore you with the details because I'm getting quite self-conscious of time and how much more I want to show you guys. Um, we'll pause in a second. I think it's coming to a quite a natural end point. We have a discussion and take more questions. But I want, what I wanted to show you is if I took this data, and here is a model, I want, I want to compare two models, one that gives me this line, and one that gives me this line. Okay, so, this is that model. I have inverted for the Wilson functions. One of them is giving me um, um, a straight line and one of them is giving me all of these wiggles and, and the integrated theory fits on the data like this. I mean, this is a 2% agreement. And it's very hard to actually see what's happening at the level of this potential. So let me now plot its derivatives and you see what's happening. I think this is quite obvious, right? Is that you're just basically, this overfitting exercise means that you got to have a potential whose derivatives have these, oops, have these little bumps and wiggles in them, such that they knock you transiently off a tractor at every point to precisely produce these wiggles. So the question is, what theory can give you this? This is the theory that can give you this. And if you're wondering, how could I even get this? I could, you know, then give you another lecture on, you know, how you get money adiabatic corrections to the common Weinberg potential, and this could be mapped to a particle production problem if you wanted to go that way. There's other things. Don't take it literally. Um, the main point of this exercise is that any characteristic scale, any evidence for some, any new scale, new wiggle, anything is new physics. And we can take that new physics and translate it just like particle physics do for parameters in an effective field theory. In order to see those wiggles in the first place, you got to move away from your priors. You got to think, oh, maybe it's more than just, um, um, you know, um, power law thing that that's easy in fact it's quite hard because then you run up against another problem which is the look elsewhere effect right the fact that we parameterize data using you know two numbers which is uh, an index and a power law is simplicity and and because the simplest models explain it and and if that happens to explain everything then that is really a way to go i really do agree 
But if you're finding more and more and more that your theories that you try to write down to realize it are finding it harder and harder to accomplish, maybe that's evidence that that parameterization might be a little too naive. So that's where we're at. And um, that's how you go, I would say, from observables to Lagrangians. That was really kind of um, the, uh, so I'm just going to conclude this, this part of the, the, the talk now. Um, is, um, is, is I really wanted to, it's, so, so this is just by the way at the level of the two point function. We can have, we can, we can try to infer higher point statistics as well. And that, you know, if somebody gave me, anybody, a dictionary, all the endpoint functions of all cosmological correlation functions to whatever order, that's a lot of information. That's the information we're trying to get at. The problem is, it's not given to us for free. So how do we get it? So let's say we're look, trying to infer the three point function of these uh, primordial correlation functions. First place to look is our penis probe. Let's look at the uh, cosmic microwave background and look at the three-point correlation function of the temperature anisotropy. Very, very crudely, if the temperature fluctuations are one part um, in 100,000, then this two-point function is a fluctuation of 10 to the minus 10. So at the level of things fluctuating in the sky, you need nano-Kelvin sensitivity, bolometer sensitivity. Um, now, if you want to look at a uh, uh, non-Gaussian something, then that's you know one part in a, in a you know, so it's a lot, right? Ten to the minus fifteen. We don't have that kind of sensitivity to just look at that. So what do we do? We can't just practically go and measure it. What we do is we come up with a template. These are these things called templates. So we say, well, let me parameterize this in a particular shape and then average over the sky and then. You know, doing this averaging basically picks up enough statistics that I, over, I overcome the weakness of the signal. Um, and that's, that's, um, and, uh, and, and, and that's, that's the sport that people have been doing. And by doing this, they found that there is no evidence for primordial non gaussianity However, those templates have assumed weak scale dependence and no deviations from vanilla slow world. So if there were, then this parameter, this template can be blind to it. And there's actually some very concrete examples where you can actually write down um, deviations where even by eye, you could see that the sky is not Gaussian, but these templates that they use would just come back with zero. So there is a strong theory dependence in what we're looking at. And I would just like to advocate that the, that the, that the story is by no means over. There could yet be interesting um, interaction statistics in cosmological observables that we're just blind to at this point. Um, I would not know, to, I don't know enough to make the statement that the, the universe is Gaussian. Um, and so in, in, in large scale structure, we actually can do a little bit better because we now have three dimensional information, right? So these modes are now, you know, so now, so now you're no longer messed up by this geometrical compression. Um, and so potentially we, uh, we can, uh, you know, we can, we can do a little bit better, but unfortunately that it's, it's only sensitive to a particular shape configuration. Um, and so we really, um, we really have a lot of work ahead to do with us. Uh, really, a lot of theoretical work ahead as well. Uh, if we're going to be able to disentangle, uh, you know, the effects of nonlinearities from initial conditions, and there's a lot of work in the effective theory of large scale structure uh, ahead. Um, and so these 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 are this is where we're where we're at. Um, and I think this is a good point to pause because this this brings me nicely to. I don't think I'll get to the third part of the talk, but maybe I can just discuss very shortly a very cute. Uh, calculation um, that also I think uh, corrects some some misunderstandings in the literature um, about the nature of loops and inflation about what happens if we only see uh, vanilla initial conditions and my, my claim is that you still get to say what didn't happen but this is a good point to pause um, so if we want to have a discussion or questions or take a small break or get a cup of tea or coffee or anything this is a, this is a good time Thank you, Subo. So, any questions or comments or anything, please, just, just go ahead. Yeah. So, please, other people, those who are attending, if you have any comments or any questions which you want to ask, please ask him. I don't know. What is asking any question? I mean, I, I, so does anybody want to take a break or? I think you can continue because there is no people too much. Like only three people are there. Shoradeep, you want to ask any question? Uh, no, sir. Okay. 
Okay. So, um, yeah, actually, uh, uh, okay, so maybe what I'll do is I'll, 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 uh, I'll go through this, uh, this part of the talk and then we can, we can just, uh, we can have a little chat. There, there's another, there's another part on spectral distortions, but I think maybe, maybe it's too much. Um, but, okay, so, so this part of the talk is, is, is starts to get a bit technical, but, um, I hope, um, uh, you know, it's, um, it'll be, there'll be a, a reward at the end, which is the, the result that you can take home from it, which is um, that even if we see nothing, but we somehow still see a gravitational wave background, you can still say stuff about what the universe wasn't. I think that's a fairly obvious statement to make. Um, but, um, and the idea is, you know, um, the non-observation of things is also uh, information content. And the um, idea is that in the early universe, if there are completely hidden fields, um, let's say dark matter is a completely hidden field. Let's say dark matter is just some completely hidden sector. Um, and it really couples to nothing other than gravitationally, then is that it? Are we done? Right? Is, is there any way of actually detecting these things? And so um, what I would say is uh, that's almost but one can also entertain that you know there are particular scenarios, exotic scenarios where there's large large numbers of hidden sectors, and these are actually quite motivated by um, these sorts of uh, you know large end copies, the standard model scenarios by Diwali and Arkani Hamed and all that try to address naturalness in this following way. Um, this is actually something that could be constrained, and so this gets more into the details of the effective theory of the adiabatic model. So you really see it in action here in a very particular. Uh, context. And um, uh, before we get there, um, we there's another wrinkle in the, the discussion of effective field theory in the presence of gravity. So I think in the previous part of the talk, we um, we saw how decoupling works differently in the presence of time dependence. Um, here, I'm going to uh, discuss another uh, subtlety of scales in gravity in the presence of matter. So um, gravity, as we know it, uh, you know, uh, how do we know what gravity is? Okay, so so really, you know, we see planets and stars and all this stuff, but um, how do we measure genius? How do we know what, you know, how strong gravity is? You need to do a Cavendish experiment because you need to know, you know, in particle physics, you want to measure the strength of a coupling you know, you have two charges and you scatter them off each other and you measure the strength of the coupling. So you need to know the charges. You need to know the two masses. You need to hold them in your hands that you only get to do when you're doing a Cavendish experiment. So gravity, for any given momentum transfer, gravitational interactions have a strength, characteristic strength uh, set by some scale, let's call it M star. And, you know, we know now that gravity, this, this strength is inferred in some effective theory with a strong coupling scale M star star, right? And in pure gravity, the strength, its strong coupling scale is equal to the same number, which we call M plus, right? That's, I'm being completely pedantic here. But in the presence of matter, actually turns out that they don't need to equal each other. Um, and this was understood um, quite some time ago by, by Diwali and collaborators. Um, and in order to understand this, we need to just basically repeat um, uh, we need to just repeat um, Cam the Cavendish experiment, but but now by switching on H bar. Okay, so this is where things get very interesting. Uh, so consider uh, some particle, some particle with some physical mass m. This is not the the two test masses you're jiggling uh, about. And imagine you're 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 scattering a test particle off of some very very heavy point mass. You know, once the impact parameter becomes, this is a very very crude cool thought, thought experiment. Once the impact parameter uh, becomes less, less than the inverse Compton wavelength of this mass, um, then virtual pairs of these particles can be created. So the volume collaborators reason that there's a positive and negative energy solution that is either attracted or repulsed from the source. And what it basically looks like is that the mass has effectively gotten bigger. The mass that you're scattering off is that you've got bigger. So gravity appears to have gotten stronger. The source has been anti screen as it were. Um, so um, this is, this sounds a bit, you know, a bit weird, but I mean, it's something like it is, is definitely true. Um, what is actually happening is the scale 
at which gravity becomes strongly coupled is lower every time there's a possibility of a species being virtually created in the early scattering process. So how do we see this? Okay. So um, at the level of you know, Feynman diagrams, I think uh, it's, it's, it's much more concrete, right? Is that to consider uh, the effects, so, so these dashed lines here, these double dashed lines here are uh, in energy momentum tensors, right? So you have two conserved forces and you're scattering, you're exchanging gravitons between them. But now imagine um, that there's a, a virtual particle that can exist in a loop, that, that, that this tree level process can be corrected by this, this loop level process. So there's some virtual to some particle whose virtual effects can be made to know, and this particle has mass m. Um, now imagine that uh, the momentum transfer now becomes so big that it's much, much bigger than this mass m. Then the theory is effectively conformal. And so, and then we already know what this two point uh, correlation function is. We stress tend to stress tend to correlation, we just read it off, it's just given by this quantity here, where this number c is the so called central charge of the theory. Um, and it just basically is counting the number of uh, scalar, fermionic, and vector degrees of freedom. So if you were to ask yourself, um, when does this correction be comparable? When does this one loop correction become comparable to the one over n Planck squared p squared correction you just got from this propagator? Uh, which, you know, it, so when you compare the free propagator to this correction, you see that the perturbative treatment fails when the momentum transfer is n Planck squared divided by square root of n where n is basically just identified with this c, okay? So let me call that scale m star star. So you can see that that scale uh, can be much, much lower than m Planck. And um, well, that was on Minkowski space. So let's, 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 let's see this another way by going to curse this. Um, I know that if I'm only interested in calculating graviton scattering, so my external legs, if you like, on my Feynman diagram, so only gravitons, um, then, um, I can reproduce all amplitudes from this effective action where the C1 and C2 is a spin weighted sum that counts the particle content of the fields running through the loop. So again, it's just some, you know, some, it just basically counts number of scalars, vectors, and they, they come with different signs depending on, on the spin of degree of freedom. Um, again, here you see clearly that um, if C1 and C2, is, you, just, you just, you know, describe them as, you know, as being portions of the number of degrees of freedom, this expansion again breaks down either when the, the momentum transfer is of order n plus squared divided by n or when the curvature is order n plus squared over n. So this is telling you that gravity uh, does not like to, uh, things become strongly coupled when the scale of gravity is greater than n plus squared divided by n. And of course, there's, there's other arguments that you can use to arrive at this conclusion, including uh, to do with black hole evaporation. Um, but whenever we sort of we give little lectures and say, ah, you know, quantum gravity is relevant at n Planck, at n Planck, we're actually selling a lie because in the standard model alone, this n is about 200. So um, in fact, in our universe, the one that we can, the, the bare minimum that we can assume in our Quantum gravity should become a thing at m Planck squared divided by ten, m Planck squared by ten. Um, so, um, um, so, so, that, so that's that's the strong coupling scale of gravity. is It's it's a, it's an independent scale to m Planck. It actually counts the number of virtual degrees of freedom that exist in your theory. There's another scale, which is the strength of gravity, which is which is a different scale, which is m, m star. And in fact, m star can be m Planck all the way up to m star star. This is a bit. It's getting a bit hairy, but it's essentially just counting the number of species that can mediate um, a momentum transfer at tree level of this process in question. So let's just look how it works for a Kaluza Klein graviton. Okay. Imagine you have uh, you have a kk mode uh, of mass mkk, and if we have a momentum transfer above this mass scale, then the tree level then we have an additional contribution to the tree level process that comes from the first kk mode. So in the regime where your momentum transfer is above the massless KK mode, but below the strong coupling scale, you see that the sum of these two guys is effectively n plus squared uh, divided by n plus one. So every KK mode, just basically, once you get above the mass threshold, and you know, m, you know, n plus squared just gets divided by additional uh, integer factor. And this is precisely how extra dimensions open up. This is exactly how you go from, let's say one over R and 
dimensions for the gravitational field would have gone square with a compact fifth dimension. It's that process we in Feynman diagrams. Um, I won't dwell on it, but the same thing happens for any university couple of species, such, such as, you know, for instance, if you have anything that's going to be commonly coupled and so on and so forth. But these are the distinctions to be bearing in mind. So there is a strong coupling scale. And I hope in the remaining 15 minutes, uh, I can show you that um, what I wanted to show you is, is how um, um, the effects of virtual fields, of hidden fields uh, on the universe uh, can actually, you can actually count the, the you can actually constrain um, some of these scenarios with large numbers of hidden species. So hidden large sec hidden sector scenarios, which, which people have been invoking to, um, to, uh, to sort of solve naturalist problems can be constrained. And, and so even if we see nothing, we still can say something about what was that's an obvious obvious statement. Both so how, how yeah. we can know about this n max. Ah yeah. So what is a strong coupling scale? How could we know about it? Is your question? Yes. Yeah, so that's that's a good question. So so um, we don't. Right? I mean, okay. So uh, the whole it well, let me, let me put it, we can't, can't predict where it is because from a low energy perspective, because we only have the spectrum that we do. We know for the standard model, it's at least M Planck divided by 10. But this is precisely, by the way, the physics behind all of these people, Diwali, Dimopoulos, and all these guys saying in the late 1990s, early 2000s, that the LHC could see quantum gravity at the TE scale. Um, is precisely is, is is effectively is that you know these extra dimension they have so many kk modes that that n is 10 to the 32 right so 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 you would you would never be able to predict it but you would certainly be warned of its appearance um in your experiments you would see that suddenly oh my god you know you'd be creating black holes for instance in, in colliders if that n was 10 to the 32 so that's how it would turn out but at a low energy at a low energy level, you will never know about it until you hit it, unfortunately. Is that clear? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is exactly just a, another a very sort of a complementary way of viewing um, extra dimensions and why people thought that they could be colliding black holes together in particle experiments um, is is to drag the scale of quantum gravity down. Um, even if M Planck is still what it is, you do a Cavendish experiment on Earth, and you know it's, you're getting G Newton, right? So G Newton is one of M Planck's squares. So um, you can have low energy M Planck, you can, you can have low energy gravity still being very, very weakly coupled, um, and you know at high enough momentum transfer, you know, but not M Planck, you can still see the effects of strongly coupled gravity. There's many different scales of playing gravity, very solid. Uh, um, Okay, what, what am I about to do here? I'm about to, to, to do a computation where I show how a large enough number of hidden fields will actually imprint on your cosmological observable if you do the calculation correctly. Um, in a way that by bounding their presence, by bounding their effects on cosmological observables, you are bounding the, the number of these hidden sectors. And, um, you know, in a way that is on the threshold of being interesting for our current uh, observational activity. And it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a, an exercise, but in doing this exercise, we actually learned uh, a lot about the nature of loops and inflation. And we believe we corrected a, a debate and we drew an under, you know, we, we, uh, we drew an underline in the debate about the nature of loops and inflation in a very pleasing way. And, and, uh, uh, and, um, and although I won't have time to discuss it, we've reduced the computation now to a three line shortcut that every undergraduate could do. So, um, and, and, and it actually conceptually, it actually really ended up conceptually closing a, a story. And that story is really the main reason we did this, but with this uh, application as a, as, a, as, a, as a bonus, if you like. So the idea is you just look at uh, the action you would get from having loops, of hidden fields. So they have no background, they're just purely quantum fluctuating. And we're particularly interested in um, tensor perturbations sort of for, for a reason that I'll make come clear very, very shortly. Uh, but you know, we can just basically expand the action, 
there's a quadratic part, it's cubic interactions, and um, look at the interaction vertices that we have. There's something to note, which is true to form. Um, this epsilon really is an order parameter, and the cubic interaction, even though naively it didn't seem like there was an epsilon in front of it with enough integrations by part, it does appear. And we have the following cubic interactions, and we are interested in, let's say, the corrections to both the curvature perturbation and the two-point function of the graviton uh, with these loops of these hidden fields. And something not interesting because this is such a cliche in, in these types of computations in high energy theory, something uh, obviously that you could do is that you, if for a large enough number of these hidden particles, which is actually the regime we're interested in from a phenomenological point of view, your computations simplify immensely because um, at large n, you can basically do uh, effectively a, a resummation um, because Feynman diagrams and more complicated topologies are subleading. Um, the question is, can you calculate these Feynman diagrams uh, to, uh, you know, correctly in the first place? So the, what we're interested in doing is computing to both the graviton and so to the graviton and the curvature perturbation, the corrections from these hidden fields in the large n limit. And in order to do that correctly, we had to basically follow a period of literature of many, many, many clever people uh, making enough mistakes that we could come afterwards and put them all together and understand what was happening. And it's very, very, very subtle. And the idea is um, time to, you know, um, when you're doing cosmology, you're calculating um, in, in correlation functions. And so um, th those Feynman diagrams that I wrote before have to be taken with a pinch of salt because they're really just diagrammatic representations of an inner correlation function. But Weinberg showed that to calculate the correction to a, um, a, a, any endpoint correlation function, it is equivalent to this nested, um, nested formula of integrals, or so he thought. Um, and um, the way it, of course, relates to the informalism is that if you wanted to you know, essentially um, take the time evolution operator on the right hand side uh, and, and, and instead of viewing it as a separate guy um, you could basically view it as being something that exists the, the, the initial uh, operator but you know evaluated this funny contour um, so if you proceed um, and just calculate it's, uh, it's, it's tedious but you can do it uh, Weinberg calculated what the uh, correction was to the two point function from let's say uh, a scalar field going through the different chaos of the sense. Um, and a bunch of authors verified it and they got the same results, um, which I find quite amusing because there are actually some uh, even normalization errors that propagated, which is silly. I don't. I think this just tells you how seriously some people calculate. Um, um, but Senatore and Zaldriaga in, in 2009 made a very strong statement, which is that Weinberg is wrong, um, and they said that this this cannot be. Uh, and in fact, the corrections cannot depend on log k. They must go like log h over mu. And what that means is that there is no running. There is no dependence on, on the scale of a loop correction. And they got this from imposing a hard cutoff of frequency space. And, and they also re-verified it, um, which is the way that I, I like to, 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 to cross-check it, is to just point out that Weinberg just missed certain terms of dimensional regularization. And um, what actually happened was that once you account for those terms, you get a log, uh, log k over mu dependent, log h over mu dependent. But there was another mistake. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, Adshead, Easter, and Lim pointed out that because you have to deform your vacuum in the infinite past, uh, you have to deform your contour to some part, some part imagine it to have a time to figure out the right interactive vacuum. The relationship here that Weinberg proved between these two. Uh, uh, is not true because this relies on the symmetry of, of, of the integration domain when you can't conjugate, which isn't true when you select out the right vacuum. It's the same way you go from, you know, time dependent perturbation theory to, to Dyson operator for the S matrix and quantum field theory doesn't work here because we're not calculating the S matrix, we're calculating a finite time correlation function. So you have a conjugate time evolution operator and there's a symmetry that's broken. And so this formula misses a lot. And so if you do it correctly, um, Turns out that um, you you get uh, an additional contribution to the log h uh, log k over mu that Weinberg calculated. 
to some to log h over mu. So the statement that Senator and Zaldiaga would make, uh, which they actually reason a priori is that this can't be the one that answer can't be correct, otherwise no model equation would be eternal. I don't necessarily buy that, but um, they did it did lead them along uh, the right answer, uh, well, not quite the right answer, but almost the right answer, is that they said that this is in fact the um, the true correct. So there's no running to loops uh, in inflation for quantum corrections. Now, um, a moment's reflection would tell you that that is also absurd, that that cannot be true. Um, um, that in fact, the only way correlation functions cannot run uh, is if you are at a fixed point of the theory. And so there's an implicit scaling symmetry at work, which is certainly true in this iterator. You have a dilat dilatation symmetry. Um, so, um, but but as, as soon as you're away from the sitter space, and which you have to be in the first place if you're dealing with non-zero epsilon, um, that running must reappear. Otherwise, quantum field theory doesn't make any sense. And in fact, that running, that what should be, it's, it's not a log H over mu running, it should be log H sub K. Um, and when I pointed this out to uh, Zaldriyaga, he's like, yeah, of course, just go and compute it explicitly. And that took me about six months, but, um, we went ahead and did it. And nevertheless, we found exactly like you would expect that in fact, the running does indeed go like log H sub K divided by mu. And the net effect of that is not only do you reintroduce the log K running, but you give it the opposite sign with an extra suppression. And this has some very, very interesting uh, consequences. So this is, this is the, the answer. So you may be wondering like, you know, why is this guy sort of so, you know, like, why is he saying I got the right number? Because as you'll see in a second, um, um, this answer has been cross-checked in a very elegant way and, and has been even further cross-checked in, in an even simplified way where we get exactly the same answer and it's like a three-line computation. So um, it really does you know, seem like we've understood once and for all what the true nature of loops and inflation is. But the point is that there's an additional correction uh, that you get from slow roll corrections not only to your uh, to your loop amplitude, but also you need to incorporate those to your counter terms. And, and what, what exists, what this blue line, what's highlighted in blue is the net correction to two point function and everything else is, is, is you know, easy to cancel by taking the right, is cancel when you use the log minimization condition and the others correspond to corrections to your counter terms. And so this is the final answer, okay, is that, you get a, you get a, you get an F, you get, this is the, the one loop correction to the graviton and the curvature perturbation uh, correlation function from a loop of uh, scalar field. And notice the extra factor of epsilon suppression that you get, which means that consistent with strong coupling, you will never ever get anything observable, forget it. So there's absolutely no chance of seeing the effects of virtual fields in um, curvature perturbations. Um, however, for, uh, at, you know, prov provided that they, they're virtual, they don't have a, a fluctuating background. If they do, then, you know, you, you have a shot. Um, now, if you, uh, if you do the same thing for the graviton, you get, um, um, you know, you also get an epsilon dependence here, which is an extra suppression, which, which you didn't have an epsilon vertex in the gravitational action in the first place. So it's quite uh, interesting to see. Um, and of course you can resum. Um, but the way we know that we've done something correct is we actually realize that if um, indeed our computation is correct, then it must have been extractable as a tree level process in the one PI effective action, which has been computed um, by other authors and other means. And of course, if you go ahead and you do it, you find complete agreement with our answer. So, um, so this is this this so this whole debate about the nature of loops and inflation could have been understood immediately from the one pi effective action. It's quite it's quite amusing to us actually, um, but it's also a nice cross check on our computations. And in fact, we've even further shortcut this computation. Uh, I, I wanted to actually present on this in this this uh, seminar, but it's just not ready yet. Um, and so, um, uh, what what can we do with it? Is that once we know what the correct answer is. Um, we can actually uh, measure what, uh, what effects they would have on cosmological observables. So if we ever were to measure tensor perturbations, um, then, uh, then we would actually see a deviation from the tensor to scalar consistency ra ra ratio 
which is uh, proportional to the number of these hidden fields. So null results, null experiments are actually much easier to, to do than detection experiments. Excuse me, so if somebody is saying, let's, um, let's constrain the, the deviation from the tensor to consistency relation to some part in C, let's say it's 10 to minus three, 10 to minus four, then you can bound the number of hidden fields by the following quantity. So let's say R is, I don't know, 10 to the minus two and C is 10 to the minus four, you can certainly say uh, the number of hidden fields is less than um, some amount. And so this may not seem like the most interesting number to you, but realize that there are some people trying to save naturalness by invoking large numbers of hidden, hidden universes that they thought that they could just get away with and, and not be constrained by anything. And here we're arguing that in fact, uh, they have to be. Um, and so this is, um, this is a natural place to stop, I think. I think I'll stop for about two hours. Um, I think we can, we can just stop here. And I was going to uh, talk about spectral distortions, but um, maybe I will, I will skip that a little bit. Time. So um, maybe actually, let me just show my concluding slides and just skip through this. There we go. Okay. So to, to just sort of conclude again with a big picture, uh, the universe, the observable universe is a, a finite box. Right? Um, we, we live in a Hubble volume. It's by definition finite. That's what you mean by observable universe. And it's a, although it's an ongoing enterprise to map all the things that are shining at us. This is a large scale structure, but you know, as, as something I would I, I'd like to, you know, advertise to the future is that one day we may be able to do the same thing for things that don't shine at us with 21 centimeter tomography. And in filling out this information, if somebody were to give a cosmologist, theoretical cosmologist with information about modes of this in the entire volume that we haven't, we have added, one that goes up to redshift of even 20 would be something that exists, you know, when the universe is like, you know, hundreds of millions of years old, right? I mean, it's really, really remarkable. Um, it would, in principle, allow us to uncompress all the primordial correlation functions and ask whatever question one is, you know, um, is there this type of non-gaussian entity? Is there this? We could really, you know, really get to work there. Of course, at this point, it's unclear whether we'll understand foregrounds well enough to be able to do that. And so, um, you know, um, these are just sort of some questions that I think are, are, are very interesting for myself, which I, I am I'm sort of pivoting towards a, on my own terms. Um, I'm just going to conclude by pointing out that, you know, um, where we're at right now um, is an interplay between theoretical priors and observation. And that is not emphasized enough by many people. And I think uh, there's a reason for that. Um, and, um, and it's not always it's just laziness. I think there is a certain sociological um, uh, the factors at play. Um, but if you're really, really honest, you have to realize that those theoretical priors could be otherwise. And if so, these numbers look very, very different. Um, and I would argue that it's only with exploring with the right priors that can we really you know, understand the true origin. We should certainly keep, uh, our, our, just keep, our, um, keep the possibilities open that um, you know, things might not be quite parameterized according to the vanilla scenarios that we think uh, there may be. Um, and yeah, so uh, I will stop here uh, and we can just have a, a discussion. So thank you very much for your, for your time and your attention. Thank you, Subodh, for providing us such an elaborative review of this little work. I'm very much interested on this like second half of your talk. Could you please provide me the, a little bit references on that, like through email? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so one of them is a published paper, and it's a bit dry, and, and another one is a work in progress that I hope to be done soon. Uh, it's been done for years, actually. I'm just really. Yeah, so. it's, it's really interesting, actually. So yeah. it would be very good that if you can able to provide some good references. Um, absolutely, yeah. My yeah. Pleasure. And then, like, yeah, I have a lot of thing in my mind, and maybe I can discuss with you as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Please. Uh, so I, I see. I see. Not that many people logged on today. I guess it's my fault for giving your uh, giving your talk title so late in the week. Yes, last no, week. No, no, it's really interesting. Actually, you uh, somehow helped me to give this yeah. talk, the second part. Yeah.
so it's okay and like uh, i don't think people have much question if you have any question guys please ask otherwise please unmute yourself and give a clap for him for giving uh, such a nice talk so and uh, like if you have any comment or anything you can say shoradi if you want to say something uh no sir it just that the math was a bit overwhelming i need to uh, sit down and chalk it through so yeah no, the good But part the is the, were... no, the good part is this talk is recorded that's why But yes sir yes yeah. you too you can go through and if you have specific yeah. doubt you can ask him directly by writing an email yes sir that's that's the yeah. good part and whoever not yes. attended they can also be benefited out of that after seeing yeah. this talk once it is posted in youtube so yeah yeah definitely but it was a very enlightening talk in that it uh, pointed out certain things that were very non trivial which i hadn't thought about before no no it's like uh, i'm also uh, feeling that it's, this is this would be very helpful to the people those who are working and those who are not working they can also think about the future directions from that yeah and uh, subodh if you want to uh, say something in the concluding session that you can say about the forum this qstm and all oh uh, yeah yeah so um um look i think uh um you know we're 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 at an interesting sort of crossroads here as a <clears throat> as a community as 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 you know cosmology and high energy theory interacting um you know i think um it really is a question you know like what are interesting problems to work on what are what are interesting things to set graduate students to work on in this project and this is something that i am grappling with quite a bit right not just because of my own immediate research future but you know i have students and postdocs that i'm now you know thinking about them um um i have a very very particular take on take on things and i'm just following my notes and that's all i would really advertise people to do and really encourage people to do is to really really understand things on their own terms and do not take because a community is doing something do not take that as this is how it is right i think uh i think um i, I am not the only person that shares the anxiety that you know that that maybe we have reached a stage of confirmation bias about a lot of the things and it is precisely by keeping our minds open and asking all of these questions and and having the courage to to not understand it because very often that's going to be the kernel of you discovering something i have found this in my career right it's just you know if someone says oh it's like this and they give you a very sort of you know compelling explanation and it just doesn't quite fit right with you so all students i would encourage you to really you know this is this is how this is how science progresses and it's actually what makes it makes it a lot of fun um i think um i think in terms of you know what what is really stuff to really think about in the future i think uh, obviously gravitational waves and gravitational waves from um you know and, and you know gravitational cosmology is something very 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 exciting as well and so um you know um uh, look i think uh, i think there's many 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 questions out there if you're willing to go exploring i think you know i think the the thing to not do is to just see what's what's on the archive what's hot you know and just continually try to play catch up with that i think that's that to me is not i mean it's not it's not how i how I wrote and I think precisely having seminars like this this you know is a really good idea sir I think it's a really good thing you're doing here because you know, it really helps people from all over the world I think it is really this pandemic has been a bit of a blessing in disguise I think because you know now we are we are now connected in ways and we are connecting in ways that we, we just didn't do before right I mean you know I think you, there's nothing stopping you from inviting anybody you want you know and yes. and getting students in India ex, you know exposure to the people everywhere so it's yeah, a that, fantastic thing you do yeah the initial idea was like when we all stuck inside the home then i thought maybe i should start this kind of thing because uh, uh this could be treated kind of as a lecture series as well because uh people used to see a lot of talks maybe feel bored to see if people come here and explain their works in detail and they it would be really good for the students those who are planning to work on this direction or something mm -hmm. like that. even people are planning for applying phd's and also they can actually if they likes the idea they can write to you and communicate with with you that 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 can be a nice option actually 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. Well, I have another. I have another call coming up, so I have to. I have to unfortunately. Uh, yeah. So uh, like, thank you, Subodh, again, and uh, stay safe and healthy. And uh, this is the end. And maybe we can see you again some other time uh, when you have time. Then you will come up with some new ideas and all. Okay. See you. It'll be my pleasure. Thank you very much, Anton. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Bye.